international criminal court judges order the interim release of former Congolese vice president Jean-Pierre Bemba. U.S. President Donald Trump says he will halt the U.S.-South Korea war games. And new gaming tech offers the user enhanced immersive virtual reality. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. Victims of the violence perpetrated by former Congolese Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba's militia are sharing their reaction on Wednesday. They say his acquittal is a severe blow to the people killed or harmed in the Central African Republic. Judges at the International Criminal Court ordered Bemba's release on Tuesday. Central African Republic's victims of the militia of former Congolese Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba reacted Tuesday to the reversal of his war crimes conviction. Eric Yamasamba lost his younger brother in 2002 when his farm was looted by Bemba's militia. For me, Bemba's acquittal is tragic. It's really, really disheartening. It's a real loss. Bemba committed various crimes. He killed, looted and plundered from us. These crimes have been happening in Central African Republic for decades, and we are still suffering. Bemba's acquittal is humiliating to us. We feel humiliated by the international community. International justice has failed us. Bemba was convicted in 2016 of war crimes and crimes against humanity and sentenced to 18 years in prison after militia he commanded committed mass murder and rape in neighboring Central African Republic. But that conviction was overturned on appeal on June the 8th in a major setback for prosecutors. Appeals judges say they could not pin responsibility on Bemba for crimes committed by soldiers under his command. Bemba's case was also the first that focuses on sexual violence as a weapon of war that was heard by the ICC. But his victims said they had been left without meaningful redress. My daughter was raped as she tried to flee with me, but Bemba's militia took her and raped her. I was horrified by it. I could go on about other crimes that were committed against my neighbors. We feel that Bemba's sentence should have been increased. He should have stayed in jail for the rest of his life. We were really surprised that he was released. As victims, we are really disappointed and frustrated by the decision that the International Criminal Court took. The 55-year-old will be handed over to neighboring Belgium, where his wife and five children live. Judges in The Hague ordered him not to make public statements about a second case in which he is accused of witness tampering. A hearing on his sentencing for witness tampering will be held on July the 4th. Member was the highest-ranking official among only four people who had successfully been prosecuted at the Permanent War Crimes Court since it was set up in 2002. The European migrant crisis is sparking tension between allies. Italy has summoned the French envoy rejecting France's criticism of its immigration policies on Wednesday, escalating a diplomatic standoff between the neighboring European powers. Meanwhile, the bodies of two migrants were carried from an Italian Coast Guard vessel Wednesday, victims of the treacherous voyage from Libya to Europe. Over 900 people, including mothers with young children, were able to disembark at the Sicilian port of Catania. Earlier in the week, Italy closed its ports to hundreds of migrants aboard a charity ship, resulting in a clash between Rome and Paris over the new migrant policy. Since Sunday, both Italy and Malta refused permission for charity ship Aquarius to dock, despite carrying some 629 migrants, including 11 children and seven pregnant women. Many migrants on the overcrowded Aquarius were mostly from sub-Saharan Africa, who had moved on to the two Italian ships from the Navy and Coast Guard and are headed for the port of Valencia, Spain. There are reports of more attacks and more deaths in northern Mozambique. Witnesses told authorities the same armed groups suspected of killing several people in recent weeks could be behind the deaths of three more in the past 24 hours. They say a man was found dead in the middle of the jungle near the coastal village of Natugo. On Monday night, the village of Changa came under attack by an armed group. Two people were killed. Both attacks occurred in the province of Cabo Delgado.
In East Africa, Uganda's former Inspector General of Police, General Kale Kaihura, and a number of his close associates have been detained for questioning. Some media report that Kaihura was picked up on Wednesday from his home about 120 kilometers from Kampala and flown to the capital city in a chopper for interrogation over yet to be disclosed allegations. A government statement denied that Kaihura was under arrest. A recent graduating class of mental health clinicians in Liberia is ready for the challenge of helping people recover from the psychological and emotional impact of years of civil conflict and the devastating effects from the Ebola virus. VOA's Kim Lewis attended the graduation ceremony in Kakata, Liberia. These are the happy voices of the March 30th, 2018 graduating class of Liberia's child and adolescent mental health clinicians. The 19 graduates are comprised of registered nurses and midwives who have dedicated themselves to the treatment of mental illnesses. It's so important to function as a mental health clinician because most especially uh, at the antenatal care uh, department we have a pregnant women coming with a lot of problems, she's depressed, but she would keep complaining, oh, I have headache, you know, I have malaria, or I can't eat, and actually when you do your investigation indeed, you will get to know that there are some underlying causes. Mary Kamara, another member of this graduating class, works with the River G County Health Team as a child survival focal person. She said she is ready for her new challenge. I have gotten to know that it was, it was important that we learn about mental health because most of the time when people come to the clinic, we just look at a physical illness. What is wrong with you physically? and we offer medical treatment and that's it. But you find out that most people come to clinic with one condition over and over and over and over and they are not getting better. So we have learned that we don't only just look at our client physical feature, we go beyond, we look at them holistically and we go beyond to find out what is really happening. Cecilia Morris is with the License and Accreditation Board for Clinicians. She said she is proud of the accomplishments made through the program. That has been one of our major um, hope that we will have more specialized and advanced nice and midwifery programs that will meet the needs of our people. And having mental health clinician in child and adolescent mental health it's a great boost to our profession, not even the only the profession, but also the country. Susan is a student at William V.S. Tubman High School in Monrovia. She's been helped by the program at her school. It really helped me a lot because I've been in the community service time, discussing my issue, so we've been discussing a lot of So it really helped me a lot. These new child and adolescent mental health clinicians are part of a team of 249 professionals trained by the Carter Center. Over 20 schools now have mental health clinicians. They look to bring a brighter future to young Liberians. Well, and Kim Lewis now joins me to tell us more about our visit to Liberia. Kim, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Vincent. Nice piece there. Thank now, you. how are the uh, Carter Center's other mental health programs helping in other sectors of society in Liberia? Well, I've had the opportunity to visit several places to see uh, how people are really benefiting from learning really what mental health is and how to get treated if they need it. And one of those organizations is the Cultivation for Users Hope. And it's really special because the patients actually run this organization. The president and the vice president both suffer from bipolar disorder. And I was able to speak with both of them just to find out really, you know, going into their background to find out really how they came about uh, to find out what was wrong with them. And they said after they received the treatment, after they got the diagnosis and the treatment, yeah. 
they were able to turn their lives around and to be able to help others. And the majority of the staff, they're in Monrovia, mm -hmm. are also patients uh, dealing with various bipolar disorders. And in a country that has uh, gone through so much trauma, we think about the young ones. How are schools yes. particularly benefiting from this? Well, the schools are really uh, good because, as you saw, that one student there, uh, whose name was uh, Susan, she's benefiting from it as well as other students because they have the mental health clinician right in the school. So what happens if they see a student that has a behavioral problem in the classroom, then that uh, teacher is, knows how to let uh, the guidance counselor know about it. And from there, they uh, take the person to the mental health clinician who actually does a physical um, you know, prognosis first and then assess the student to see if they need help. And the other good thing about this program for students is that the parents also are part of it. Now they have a separate program for parents as well. Absolutely. Yes. For people to understand why a kid might be behaving in the way they Absolutely. do. Absolutely. And you have to remember that they're coming out of, you know, the, War, the trauma Ebola, of the Ebola that, crisis and civil and on a type of being an adolescent and exactly. a teenager. It can be difficult. Now, yes. what is your biggest, uh, greatest takeaway from your experience in Liberia? I think for me, no matter who I talked with, I talked with people from various sectors of society in Liberia. I talked with police officers, correction officers, teachers, mental health clinicians, and all of those people that went through the training uh, said that it helped uh, improve their lives. It made them more compassionate mm. against people that have mental illnesses. It took away that stigma that many of them have, and even the clinicians who are trained medical professionals, their um, midwives, their RNs, they said it helped them to realize this person really has a serious problem that can be treated, and if they stay on the treatment, they can live a normal life. Wow, great. Yes. Kim, thank you very much for Thanks your report for and me. your insights. We thank do appreciate you. it. Uh, that's uh, VOA uh, reporter Kim Lewis. And we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. You're watching Africa 54. In a moment, what are military personnel saying about the outcome of the U.S.-North Korea summit? But first, here's a look at Wednesday's headlines. All right. Report releases ex Congolese Vice President Jean Pierre Bemba following his acquittal on charges including war crimes, rape, and crimes against humanity. We stay in the DRC where the head of the World Health Organization declares that the country is not yet victorious in the war against the Ebola epidemic despite recent advancements in vaccines. In Nigeria, Donald Duke, the former governor of Cross River State, announces he's running in next year's presidential election. In Somalia, the government forces the liberation of a southern Somali town that Al-Shabaab targets for taxation revenue. Finally, three-time African champions Nigeria train in Russia ahead of their first game on June 16 in the World Cup. The team will face Croatia. Economic stability is central to the global development agenda, but the word stability itself is often missing from the global development dialogue. In a climate where many agreements are not doing enough to create economic stability for its citizens, how are entrepreneurs and innovators filling the gap? Here to talk about it is Phil Asilos, Asia Pacific Technical Advisor for Economic Development and Innovation, also Principal Researcher for FHI 360's Atlas of Innovation for Economic Stability. Welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Vincent. First, just help us understand what you do. Uh, so I work for an international nonprofit organization that improves the health and well-being of people around the world and in the United States. And we do that through uh, research and implementing programs around the world, uh, a lot of them having to do with, uh, with innovation, uh, bring mm -hmm. new innovation to achieving sustainable development goals, saving lives, and yeah. um, 
yeah. you know, really helping helping advance prosperity around the world. Yeah. Now, you created this uh, uh, Atlas uh, Innovation, the Atlas of Innovation for Economic. Uh, what is the purpose? The purpose is really to, for the first time, showcase all of the innovations that are coming out of the private sector, also the public sector, and the international nonprofit sector that enhance economic stability for poor and vulnerable people around the world. And it's, it's really in service of a broader goal to help economies become more inclusive uh, of more people, especially poor and vulnerable people. Uh, who might have been left out uh, of recent economic growth since the financial crisis. And we know that, uh, you know, without stability, you cannot have any economic right. uh, development. Uh, what are the, uh, especially entrepreneurs doing in an mm -hmm. environment where there might not be general stability? Right, right. Well, I, you know, I think the people who have really taken the brunt of instability in the past are, uh, in Africa, are small farmers and merchants who are flying blind in many cases, don't have access to great information. They're going it alone. They don't have, uh, they, they take all the risk. Mm -hmm. you know, they had, until recently, they had no insurance, uh, no means of spreading the risk. Um, I think what's, what's changing right now is that because of mobile phone technology and the, the role of data in the economy, yeah. now, uh, you know, this is all changing. More small farmers, merchants are, are getting access to services through and, their mobile phones. And you actually have some examples, I think, from, is it Kenya, Uganda, and some That's other right. countries where uh, these things well, are working. You know, in Africa, the real hotspots for entrepreneurial innovation and technology development are Kenya and Nigeria, a little bit of Uganda, a little yeah. bit of South Africa. I mean, in Kenya, you have an amazing diversity of innovation from Farm Drive, a company founded by two young Kenyan women uh, who are uh, essentially providing a credit bureau for smallholder farmers and for the first time making them uh, able to get loans and investment. Uh, also in Kenya, the Usalama panic button app, mm -hmm. uh, private emergency services uh, help people deal with emergency situations. So if your life is threatened, your economic stability is threatened, and if you can save it, you can enhance your And of course, stability. governments need to know that uh, the contribution of citizens lead to economic development of a yeah. country as a whole. So what right. should governments do to enable uh, in small businesses right. Uh, operate in a safe way? You know, open data is a big one. India is really providing the example for how to make uh, digital identities uh, something on which entrepreneurs can build new services, services the government might not even think of. The government should continue to do what they're good at, providing safety nets, good regulation, macroeconomic management, but they also need to realize there are lots of private services that help individuals uh, make better decisions, invest in their future, and uh, become more resilient to volatility and shocks in the economy. And the more open they are with data, with identities, with information, uh, the more they'll support entrepreneurs in advancing that. In, in few words, do you get the sense that African countries particularly r recognize the contribution made by small businesses? Mm, that's a difficult question. I, I certainly think that uh, there are countries that are leading the way. Uh, Kenya, mm. uh, Rwanda, uh, both uh, very dynamic entrepreneurial environments, uh, focus on digital innovation. Uh, others may not have the capacity yet to, to really overtake, uh, overtake their challenges, but I think it's coming. Well, big topic. We'll talk about this perhaps even uh, a bit lengthy next time. Uh, thanks a lot, Phil, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having All us. Right. Uh, that's uh, uh, Phil Silos, uh, who is an uh, Asia-Pacific Technical Advisor for Economic Development and Innovation and we appreciate his joining us today on the program. Now, the Singapore summit ended with the United States and North Korea committed to denuclearizing de the, uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, President uh, Donald Trump of the U.S. repeatedly expressed his commitment to halt what he called joint military war games between the U.S. and ally South Korea. Trump's decision has left allies and the U.S. service members on the peninsula needing further clarification. A VA Pentagon correspondent, Kalabab, explains further. A historic moment in Singapore, with Trump holding talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and telling VOA contributor Greta Van Susteren he wants to halt joint U.S.-South Korea military exercises that have been taking place for decades. We are going to get out of the, the war games that cost so much money, you know, where we because I think, number one, it's very provocative, and I want to do it, and I think they're very happy about it because it is so provocative, but it costs a fortune to do it, and we won't do that as long as we're negotiating in good faith. 
Some experts were surprised to hear an American president characterize the joint exercises in the same way China and North Korea have described them. He called it provocative himself, which is not something that any American president, I think, has ever done. It's always been defensive in nature. South Korea seemed caught off guard by the decision, with a government spokesman saying, quote, we need to find out the precise meaning or intentions of President Trump's remarks. And a U.S. military spokesman in Korea told reporters troops have received no updated guidance on the execution or secession of training and would continue with current military posture until they received official word to change course. Some see Trump's decision to halt the military exercises as a setback and a concession. If you look back uh, earlier this year, uh, Kim Jong-un had made a statement essentially stating that uh, he, ex he understood the, uh, the validity, the, the legal validity, the need to hold these exercises. And then now we're a few months later where pr President Trump is saying, well, no, we're getting rid of these exercises. It's been such a huge turn in events without really much action on the North Korean side. Others disagree, hailing the choice as a bold first step to the ultimate goal of denuclearization. If taking these actions, and it's just a pause, it's not, it's not a concession, we're literally giving nothing. We're simply not taking action here while continuing to train, and we have our capabilities that are not diminished. But if that can lead to a, a diminishing of threat uh, and, a, and lead eventually to a peace treaty, uh, that's definitely something that's in America's interests. There are 28,500 American troops in South Korea, but only a small fraction, about 3,500 of them, make up the single U.S. combat brigade on the peninsula. Davis suggests Trump could go so far as to make the potential transfer of these troops a negotiating chip in further talks. What's the purpose of those troops at all? It's to protect us. But if removing those troops can be a component of protecting us even to a greater degree, then that's something we should give serious consideration to. For now, any change to U.S. troop numbers on the peninsula remains off the negotiating table, as Trump looks to Kim to provide verifiable steps toward denuclearization. Well, that was VOA Pentagon correspondent Caliban reporting. Now, Jeremy Randall converted from Christianity to Islam just before his marriage last month to his bride from East Africa. While converting to another religion can pose new challenges, just a few days after returning from their honeymoon, the new words, a suburban Washington, D.C. couple began their first Ramadan together. As viewers Betty Ayub reports, the groom's commitment to his new religion is being tested. In a typical house in the suburbs of Maryland lives a not-so-typical family. For these newlyweds, Ramadan this year comes with its own challenges. This was Jeremy's first Ramadan as a Muslim. Uh, I converted uh, to the Muslim religion three months ago. Um, it was a long process. Uh, I was raised Christian uh, and had to you know, learn a bit about the religion. Um, but my best teacher uh, was my wife um, and her family. I've been fasting since I was about his age. Um, so to just dive right in, uh, I commend him. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not simple and it's not easy. Your instinct takes a while. I was going to pop one of these in my mouth. <laughs> what was most challenging for me? Um, converting and getting myself to a point where I was confident enough in our relationship to bring this to my parents, but they took the news well, I think, uh, because they love Ariam. Jeremy converted to Islam on March 17th at the Muslim Community Center of Maryland. According to the Pew Research Center, 9% of new American Muslims say the main reason for their conversion to Islam was marriage. You know, asking someone to convert was a huge deal for me. Um, so when it came down to his family, that was something for me um, was terrifying. But like he said, he, they were very supportive um, and they saw, I guess, that you would be, both of you would be in good hands. Jeremy is a widower. His first wife, Jeremiah's mother, died from cancer five years ago. It was just the two of us. Um, and uh, Ariam and I met um, and I knew immediately she was uh, someone special and I hadn't met 
anyone remotely like her. And the idea of fasting for a month is probably not something he gave much thought to either. But now, more than halfway through the holy month, the Ramadan fast is getting easier on the couple. It's not home stretch, you know, to, to say, oh, you know, Eid is around the corner, you know, mm -hmm. and how many days are left, you know, I'm not crossing out calendars. Well, I've got an app. I've got an app. It's the <laughs> Muslim Pro app. And I think the days are being crossed off. I didn't make that. <laughs> but what about 10-year-old Jeremiah? Is he fasting too? Um, no, I am not <laughs> taking part in Ramadan. <laughs> Although Jeremiah is now being raised in a Muslim home, Aryam, whom Jeremiah has called mom since the marriage, agrees with both her husband and her adopted son that it will be up to him to choose the religion he is most comfortable with. Fast or no fast. Betty Ayoub, VOA News, Washington. Welcome back to Africa 54 and here's what's trending. For many gaming fans, virtual reality is the ultimate platform. At the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Los Angeles, had where developers are delivering controllers to help further immerse gamers and enhance the experience. Real and virtual controls have enabled VR manipulation for years, but new devices are helping to extend control to human interfaces like hands and feet. One company has even launched tech that allows users to run in virtual reality a task which has been extremely difficult to achieve with immersion technology. And in other gaming news, last year's Assassin's Creed Origins took gamers to ancient Egypt. Now the popular franchise is going another 400 years into the past to ancient Greece, where the year is 431 BC. The game allows players to interface with some of the founding fathers of Western civilization, such as Greek statesman Pericles and the philosopher Socrates. Gamers can choose whether to play as a, female, a male or female character, both are equally strong. They'll all uh, also be able to customize their appearance. The game also includes open world naval experiences, meaning gamers can set sail and travel to different Greek islands. And that's what's trending today. Well, that's our show for today. Now, be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. A slope can describe a surface or area that is not level. If something is slippery, it is hard to stand on. Slippery slope. It sounds as if Jonathan and Anna will fall down. So, Jake came into the office late again. He told me he has been drinking every night this week. <laughs>